Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here to make this uh, keynote speech. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces uh, who I've worked with uh, over the years. Uh, honorable chief guest, respected special guests, panelists, and speakers, distinguished participants, dear friends and colleagues, a very welcome and a very good morning to you all. Uh, before I talk about education in Bangladesh, let me talk about the country first, if I may. Uh, and let me actually make a contrast of what we have achieved using ICT in the last few years, in the last uh, five to six years. Now, typically, when we talk about Bangladesh, we talk about a glass that's half empty. This is uh, uh, globally a picture that we see of Bangladesh. Uh, we have made a lot of achievements, but despite that, we talk about a poor country, a country that's uh, largely illiterate. And if you talk about English literacy, that's insignificant almost. I mean, English in Action program is making a huge dent in that, uh, in that problem, but uh, still, English literacy is insignificant. Uh, electricity. Uh, a very key ingredient for ICT is also lacking. Uh, we have just ab above 60% under grid electricity, and that's also very unreliable. Although we have seen in the last year, year and a half, that reliability is increasing. And we also have a lot of uh, solar power being used in the rural areas. Now let me talk about service delivery, because that's one of the key areas, even we, if we talk about education, I think it is very tightly tied with the service delivery uh, aspect of the country. It's very uh, need unresponsive. It's complicated. People don't really know where to go, who to talk to. They fall into the hands of the unscrupulous middlemen. Uh, extremely male biased. If to stand in line to get any service from the government, typically, although that's changing, and I'll talk about that. Uh, there is a lot of rent seeking. Uh, which made us uh, a winner in the corruption list for a number of years. Fortunately, we're not in that position anymore. But then, if the glass is half full, that must also mean that the glass is half, uh, sorry, if the glass is half empty, that must also mean that the glass is, glass is half full. And it's becoming fuller by the, by the year and by the month, actually. So we have achieved, in the last six years, significant poverty reduction from 40% to 26%. Literacy has increased from about half to about 65%. Uh, electricity grid, that has a remarkable progress. We've seen remarkable progress in uh, spread of electricity around the country. We have some key ingredients for ICT, uh, higher bandwidth around the country. That's spreading very, very fast. Internet use, if you look at the number, in 2008 was about 0.4 percent. Today we boast nearly 24 percent of the population under internet use. Uh, mobile users have also grown about five-fold in the last six years. Social media, we have about seven plus million people using Facebook and other blogging sites. Uh, we say that there is a new Facebook user born every 20 seconds, but there is a new child born every 12 seconds. So Maybe very soon we'll have Facebook taking over our population growth, Facebook growth taking over our population growth. Uh, and a very important policy reform in many ministries has happened over the last few years. Uh, we had an ICT policy in 2000 uh, that was developed in 2002 that was not very functional, that was revised in 2009, and we have a very robust ICT policy, along with many other policies that have been developed in the last few years, broadband uh, and education. We have the first education policy in the country now, as you all know. I'll talk a little bit about that. But very importantly, in the list of policies that you see at the bottom of the, of the slide, there is an important policy called public-private partnership. And a lot of what I'll talk about today is because that policy now exists, and there is a law that allows a lot of very productive collaboration and partnership across the public sector and the private sector, and also development partners. <coughs> Let me start by talking about one story, uh, which started in 2007. 
in two union councils, union purishads of the country. Uh, two digital centers were established. The idea was to, there was actually three ideas that, uh, that we were nurturing at that time. The first idea was to take services as much as possible to citizens' doorsteps. So most of these union councils are about two to three kilometers of where people live. About 70% of our people live in the rural areas. And to these 70% 70, 70 people, uh, these union purishads are the first place to go to for the government, to access the government services. The second idea was to empower these local rural, uh, local government institutions. And the third idea was to create a gender parity, both in terms of service provision and in terms of service access. And I'll talk about how that happened. Uh, each center at that time, in 2007, we're talking about two centers, two locations in the country, uh, started, each started a center where we took a few of the government services to that center. So birth registration was already there. It started becoming electronic. So previously it was on a, on a piece of paper and we started developing an uh, electronic database for birth registration. And that was the first big step in terms of how people saw that uh, IT was actually making a, an impact in their lives in the rural areas. Uh, over time, these two centers actually grew to about 100 centers in the next two years by 2000. Uh, eight and nine, and in 2010, this actually grew countrywide to cover all 4,500 union councils of the country. And at the same time, we saw a lot of service providers, both from the government, for instance, the Ministry of Land. Uh, they, Ministry of Land sells land records from the district administrator's office, the DC offices, as you all know. There's a record room. Uh, citizens have to go, stand in line, possibly sometimes fall in the hands of the unscrupulous middlemen, uh, and they get access to these land records that they, they need. That's a vital service for the government provides to citizens, but it's a very hassle-ridden service. It used to be a very hassle-ridden service. Now citizens can actually go to these centers, these 4,500 centers, instead of going to the DC office, about 35, 40 kilometers away, and can apply for a land record. In the last uh, three and a half years, we've been able to provide about 3 million land records electronically to citizens. So in the list of things that you will see here, the first bullet was the only electronic service in 2007, the birth and death registration. Over time, the exam results from the public examinations were also being available from these centers. Now we send SMS, uh, email-based uh, exam results. A lot of forms can be downloaded from these uh, from these centers, instead of going to the specific offices, to the upazilas, and to the districts, citizens can actually access these forms, which is the first entry point to apply for a service to the government. Uh, they can uh, get these forms from these 4,500 centers. Uh, on Sunday, next week, we're actually launching a portal. The Honorable Speaker will be launching it. And that will have over 1,000 of the most important forms of the government. So that's, a, again, a leap forward. On the right column, you'll see a number of services that come from the private sector. So we have partnership with a number of banks which provide mobile banking. Uh, banking services were unheard of at that level, at the rural areas. With the introduction of these centers and with the public-private partnership, a lot of banking services are available there. Life insurance is available. Uh, several of these centers are working on providing English language instruction uh, with the help of British Council. So these are all possibilities that we've been able to tap into because of two things. One, we've been able to take the connectivity, and two, we've been able to take an entrepreneurial mindset to running these centers. A quick snapshot of what has been achieved to make the glass fuller by the year and by the month. Uh, from the Union Digital Center, uh, we have seen about 46 million services delivered in the last three and a half years. 111 million births were registered electronically. Uh, 3 million land records, 24 million utility bills over mobile phones. 
2.4 million sugarcane purchase orders, 11 million money orders through post offices, and 1.2 million railway tickets bought over mobile phones. And if you look at the education sector, uh, exam results, 64 million. Uh, 4.2 million students now study in 20,500 multimedia classrooms across the country in secondary schools. I'll explain the multimedia classroom. That's, we think that's a foundational step to making more progress to uh, improve the quality of education in the country. Uh, 39,000 teachers are now interacting over this teacher's portal. This teacher's portal was also developed with the help of British Council. 39 million results of public exams and 2.9 million admission applications through SMS. And I'll talk about the last one maybe for a minute. Uh, even three years ago, a girl uh, who just uh, passed her high school exam, the HSC exam, with a good grade, would have to travel to every public university where she would want to apply. So she would have to travel to Sillet, she would have to travel to Rajshahi, Chittagong, Dhaka, wherever she would want to. So she'd get the form, she'd fill it out, pay the fee, uh, and then submit it again, and then appear again for taking the admission test. Now, other than the admission test, all these other steps require absolutely no travel. So the girl sends an SMS. The cost of the SMS is about two taka, sometimes even less. Uh, whereas the cost of travel we've calculated was about 2,000 taka to go to each of these because this girl would not be able to travel on her own. She'd have to take somebody along with her. She would not travel from Borishal or Potuakali to go to Silet on her own. So the cost of travel, uh, staying overnight and all that, just to apply was 2,000 taka. So 2,000 taka has become two taka. Uh, we saw just in 2013, uh, there is a national savings of about 850 crore taka because this SMS-based admission application uh, was introduced by the public university. So these are small steps creating mammoth leaps for the entire nation. Now let me talk about education. So fast forward to 2030. So students that are entering the education system now will actually graduate from universities in 2030. Many will drop out before that for many reasons, poverty, uh, uh, social pressure, getting married, uh, many different reasons. But if we can actually look at what, where we stand today and where we will stand in 2030, then it should become clearer to us what kind of educational priorities we should set for ourselves. The population will grow by about 50 million. Urbanization will go from 30% to 40%, so we need to figure out how to make more effective urban schools and how to actually make our education uh, better in the urban schools as well. Uh, the status, economic status of the country will go from an LDC to most possibly high middle income. I mean, we want to achieve middle income by 2021. So by 2030, we should become a moderately high middle income country. The size of the economy globally is 49th. Uh, by 2030, the expectation, the aspiration is to reach the 30th position, 30th largest economy in the world. Uh, strategy today is mostly about survival. It will become a strategy of growth. So we need to keep that in mind as we design our educational system for the next 16 years. So the questions, obviously, for the two-thirds of our population who will be in the working age, what kind of skills will they need? We're already seeing that we're competing with Sri Lankans to, uh, to get a job in Malaysia. We send about 400,000 people outside the country every year. So what kind of skills do they have? What kind of skills should they have today? What kind of skills should they have tomorrow? We also do a lot of uh, work in the country for buyers outside, obviously in the garment sector. So let's actually take a look at that. Employment, as I said, is going global because of migration and because of outsourcing. We are seeing a lot of outsourcing happening in many sectors. Obviously, the prominent one, about 75 to 80% of our exports is, is ready-made garments. But there are other sectors that are also growing. Uh, IT is a big sector. And we are putting from the government, there is a significant push to increase that as a, as a diversified sector. 
there is a change in mindset that's, that's very prominent among the youth. Uh, it's changing from an employment-seeking mindset to an employment generation mindset. So it's self-employment and small and medium enterprises that we are seeing, not because of microcredit only, but because there is greater confidence among the youth to do something innovative, to take control of their own lives. And uh, you will see this uh, very interesting phenomena in a, in a country that's unlikely as Bangladesh, that uh, Dhaka has become the third largest sought after freelancing destination for IT. So it's not outsourcing destination, it's freelancers. So individuals who actually do a lot of work, uh, we, I think, uh, earned about $23 million last year uh, through these uh, about 20 to 30,000 freelancers. And they actually are all over the country. About 50% in Dhaka, 50% outside of Dhaka, which is remarkable. Because if you look at the IT industry, it's in Dhaka, about 95% of it is in Dhaka. So the fact that we are able to proliferate freelancing across the country uh, shows that the confidence is, is actually spreading throughout the country. Now, several of the speakers before talked about uh, communication skills, language skills, soft skills. Uh, education is becoming softer. So the concept of soft skills becoming very important is a reality today. So education is embracing this concept as well. So we're talking about critical thinking and problem solving. And we should also embrace this not as a concept only, but as a, but as a practice in our education system. The question is, are we doing that effectively? School is living the building. So it has already left in many countries. It's also leaving in Bangladesh. And it will happen more and more. We have seen about 11% of our education coming from schools today. The rest of the percent, which is 89%, comes from TV, from radio, from mobile phones, from talking to friends, family, neighbors, and our society. So it's an important aspect that we need to consider to design our new education system. Uh, sustainable learning. I mean, this is something that you, that you all know, that we can only retain about 10% of what we read, 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% of what we see and hear, and 70% of what we say, and 90% of what we practice. So the question that is obvious to us, how can we increase more practice in the school system? Today, it's almost limited to reading and hearing, and maybe some seeing. So how can we make that transition into more practice so that we can have much better retention of what we do in classrooms? There are three main challenges that I want to, want to point out. There are many others, obviously. The first one is poor market relevance of the skills that we're producing in the education system. The second one is inadequate certification standards. The schools, the universities, the institutes of education, whether they are producing the right quality for the market. Are we assessing that? And important lack of focus on three areas. The soft skills I've already mentioned. Uh, entrepreneurship skills. Uh, somebody the other day said that as we graduate more and more throughout the system, so we become a primary school graduate, secondary school graduate, university graduate, we become less entrepreneurial, at least in Bangladesh. So obviously, we're doing something categorically, deliberately in the system, in the education system, to kill our entrepreneurship spirit. So what can we do so that it doesn't happen, so that we actually uh, nurture the curiosity, nurture the risk-taking mentality of a, of a child throughout the education system and produce an entrepreneur at the end of his or her school, school years. And very importantly, vocational skills. Today we have about 8% of our students going to the vocational stream. The target is to go to about 20% by 2021. What are we doing to address that? So something that I mentioned before, so we are growing. I think we are, we are looking at the glass half full uh, glass is also getting fuller. Uh, the glass half empty is becoming less of a problem. But then this is also happening for other countries, right? So this is happening for Sri Lanka, this is happening for Vietnam, this is happening for Myanmar. 
So are we growing fast enough? Our competition is not within Bangladesh, it's outside. So are we growing fast enough? Digital Bangladesh. Let me talk a little bit about that. <coughs> um, this was a political slogan that has actually brought a huge momentum to what we were doing. The two centers that I talked about in Union Purishas in 2007 took a huge leap in 2009 and 10 and became a countrywide phenomenon. Why? Because there was very strong political will to take it countrywide, to scale up nationwide. So this was a very important uh, uh, phenomenon that we saw. And the political will has also created a lot of what I just talked about, uh, the, the high-speed connectivity around the country, entrepreneurship, uh, many services that have been decentralized, like land, banking, and so on and so forth, and education. Uh, you'll see that the, out of the four major components of Digital Bangladesh, the foundational component is capacity development. And Ministry of Education has developed the only master plan using ICT. So this is the only ministry that has developed an ICT in education master plan with the leadership of our honorable uh, education minister who will be here with us tomorrow at the closing. So there are seven objectives in the ICT in education master plan, which I would uh, draw your attention to. But instead of going through all these seven, I would like to actually summarize them into two. So this talks about teaching learning environment, professional ICT skills, and so forth. But when I look at these seven, uh, I'm reminded of something that I read many years ago in a book that has nothing to do with development. That was, I think, a novel. But it had one sentence that, that actually uh, remained in my mind. It read, oh, uh, development in developing countries often produces overdevelopment of objects and underdevelopment of people. So when I look at this list, I see, I, I, I'm, I'm actually scared that we will actually make a huge progress in number one on the left, teaching learning environments. So we'll set up the multimedia classrooms, we'll donate a lot of computers, we'll connect all the classrooms with high-speed internet, but we won't make enough progress in number four, which is market-based skills because we'll be happy with making huge progress in number one. So what I would like to propose is that when we read the ICT in Education Master Plan, we read an integrated goal. And this is a proposal, by the way. So it's not been incorporated yet. This was just a proposal I made very recently. So world-class market-based skill development through participatory teaching learning environment facilitated by motivated teachers. So motivated teachers is actually an incredibly important goal for us. If the teachers are not motivated, they will not be able to teach, they will not be able to facilitate, they will not be able to inspire in classroom. And no matter how much ICT we bring to the classroom or to the school or we provide access to the students through Facebook and many other means, it's not going to change our educational quality. So teacher remains the central point for improving the quality of education. And the second thing is about high quality service delivery in the education system. So it's not the quality of education, but educational service. So admissions, uh, exams, uh, uh, basically uh, getting your uh, child enrolled, school enrolled, teacher enrolled. So those are many services in the education system that also we want to improve. Let me also talk about another story <clears throat> with 23 teachers and seven schools in, uh, from 2010. Up until 2010, we had been toying with education to improve the quality of education, toying with uh, ICT to improve the quality of education. Uh, we had partnered with Microsoft, we had partnered with Intel, we had partnered with many other uh, technology companies. And the goal was to teach the teachers technology products. So with Microsoft, we taught them how to use Microsoft Office very well. So they knew how to make a text bold. They knew how to format. They knew how to create a table. They knew how to create good PowerPoint slides. But in a school, these have absolutely little relevance, or possibly no relevance whatsoever. Uh, the teachers, when we were actually going to this workshop, I remember this, uh, 23 teachers from seven high schools 
out of these 23, about 11, 11 of them had not touched a computer before. So they said that this is bogus. This is actually rubbish. What you're teaching us is absolutely no, not useful. Teach us how to search on the internet. Because the internet already has a lot of educational material, YouTube, uh, many other sites have very interesting pictures, videos, uh, sometimes even uh, 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 text that's, that's very interesting. So as long as we can find them, we can use them in classrooms. So teach us how to search and teach us how to plagiarize. So plagiarize probably is not the, the best word to use, but that is exactly what they told us to do. So tell us how to steal from, from all these different great works that nameless people have done around the world. So that's exactly what we did in this, in this uh, new curriculum for teacher training that we did that ultimately became the multimedia classroom. Before talking multimedia classroom, let me break three myths also that have plagued our policymakers for years. The first myth is that ICT in education, so increasing the quality of education Using ICT means, ICT education, means that we have to learn how to use the computer. So we have subjects teaching how to use the computer in the, in the, uh, in the classroom today. And we also had them before. But we learned from these 23 teachers, it's about changing the quality of education, not about changing the quality of ICT education. ICT does not need to be taught to students. So that's the second myth that I want to dispel. I don't know of any child between the ages of, let's say, six, or maybe even lower, to the ages of uh, maybe 16 or 18, that need training on how to use the computer, that need training on any ICT device, no matter what his or her IQ is. I think it's inherent that a child will actually gravitate towards these devices, because it's fun. It's just innately useful to them. So the process of trying to teach how to use these computers is sort of counterproductive. And we also felt, at one point, we don't feel that anymore, is that the first step in introducing ICT in a, in a, in a school is to set up a lab. So people, the kids will actually go to this lab and they'll learn how to use the, these devices. So let me come to the to a very important aspect of educational quality development in our country, multimedia classrooms. It's not rocket science. This is actually in many other countries. But one unique differentiator that we have made uh, in this, that I'll mention in the, in, the, in the next slide, is to bring teachers together to produce content. And I'll come to that in a second. But the focus of this multimedia classroom in, is not to reduce digital divide. I don't think we should talk about digital divide. We should talk about reducing the educational divide. And these multimedia classrooms should squarely focus on that. Uh, we have made all our 305 textbooks and teacher's guides into electronic books. So you go to the NCTV website, you'll actually see an ebook website that covers primary, secondary, madras, and uh, vocational uh, teaching streams. And 33 of these books, uh, mostly in the primary schooling, have been turned into digital talking books, which actually read out the, the text to you. And this is very important for uh, visually challenged children who are still in the system. And the, about 72, I think, secondary school books are also being converted. It'll be done by the beginning of, uh, or by, by the end of this year, actually. There is a public-private partnership that's developing this process. So teacher training. So all, all that I talked about must prepare the teachers for developing the new kinds of skills for the world to compete globally. So what kind of content? What kind of practices in classrooms? What kind of mentoring that the teachers must have? So they can only go so far with mentoring from their colleagues. We don't have to have experts as mentors. So schools that are doing well, teachers that are doing well in some schools that are doing not doing well. So teachers are also doing well in schools that are not doing so well. So there are very, very qualified teachers, very innovative teachers in schools. We have actually, we roam the country looking for these teachers. They can act as mentors. Collaboration. The 
teacher's portal that was developed with the assistance of British Council is a monumental example of how teachers are collaborating to produce content for each other. They're also competing against each other. We have this teacher's competition that bring together the best teachers which inspire other teachers. So this is the teacher's portal. It's unfortunately in Bangla for those of you who cannot read Bangla. Um, actually, there is maybe one or two words in English, perhaps. <laughs> the English word is in English. The rest is in Bangla. Uh, so you'll see very interesting uh, pieces there. They're about uh, in this in this whole structure over the last one and a half years that this has existed, we have about 39,000 teachers collaborating today, uh, mostly from the secondary schools. We want the primary school teachers to, to join this effort as well. Uh, on the right side, you'll see that the best teacher of the week is recognized by the system. The most active teacher who produces the best digital content by plagiarizing from across the world. So they get recognized. And we want this number to grow to about 350,000 in the next two years, 350,000 teachers. Some statistics, we did a very small sample size uh, survey of these multimedia classrooms, but we see that uh, retention of subject matter in classrooms has actually improved for, for, uh, for children. We see the teacher's confidence increasing in two ways, because the teacher is more active in the classroom. The teacher is a facilitator now rather than a lecturer. The teacher is also helped by a content that was produced by a more mature teacher, a more prepared teacher. Because these content, these slides, this video actually prompts a much better educational delivery, much better facilitation within the classroom. And the head teachers agree. In the schools that we have uh, visited, they actually agree that this is a good thing. And we're talking to several countries uh, in Asia, in Latin America, and in Africa to see whether this can be replicated there, obviously localized to the, to the needs of the context. Uh, English in action has proved that English is a technology. So to go to other countries where, where our workers have to communicate, uh, English is an essential tool. And uh, we're very happy to see that English in Action has done some remarkably innovative steps using multi-modal media, TV, radio, internet. And uh, from access to information, we're also exploring all these media. So I think we can s definitely learn a lot from English in Action. And we hope that the uh, memorandum of understanding that we started at one point will be signed very soon so that we can take that process forward. Uh, a few possibly game-changing uh, initiatives that are coming on the horizon. Uh, we're trying to develop an e-learning platform with Bangladesh Open University. That'll touch, uh, after a few years, millions of learners around the country. Uh, we're developing with the Ministry of Expatriate Welfare a platform for the migrant workers so that people who have left the country, who are working in many countries, about uh, 8 million plus of our uh, workers, probably 10 million. Uh, and the 400,000 that leave every year, about 320,000 without any kind of training, can actually tap into this resource from wherever they are, before they leave the country, after they leave, from wherever they are, they can access their mobile phones and the internet. Uh, we're also working with private sector institutions and universities to develop uh, and possibly plagiarize also. Uh, UK actually has developed this uh, technology called Raspberry Pi. It's a small computer that does everything the computer does. It looks like a matchbox, uh, and you just attach a monitor to it. It costs about 25 to $30. So we're exploring whether we can make it useful for our local context. Uh, we're also working with several NGOs to develop ICT mechanisms for children with special needs. Uh, the collaboration and the co-creation aspect that, that are done by teachers, using the, the taboo word plagiarism, uh, we are seeing that that's becoming very effective because teachers are working together. They are empowering themselves and feeling a 
sense of empowerment that has never been produced by our system of teacher education. So we want to widen that and deepen that. And we're work working with a, uh, with a very creative university, a public university, to create a creative questions data bank. And that's, that, that'll be done through crowdsourcing. We have not proved that concept yet, but we are exploring whether that'll be useful. Our honorable prime minister remarked uh, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, in the inauguration of the multimedia classroom, that the unused or underutilized uh, TV channel that is now Shangshot TV, the Parliament TV, can be used for education. And we are exploring the possibility of that. Uh, we are working with BTV and Shangshot TV and several development partners uh, who have come forward to uh, give us their ideas, their feedback on designing what we're calling a human development media, where TV is in the center, but then we have FM radio that's on the rise. Uh, FM radio, as you know, is heard through mobile phones mostly. 73% of the listeners access or listen to radio through mobile phones. So very interesting paradigm shifts are taking place. So we want to leverage those, that paradigm shift by looking at social media, radio, TV, uh, and many other uh, technologies that are before us to develop a human development media. And we've already gotten approval for developing a separate foundation, which will be a public-private trust. So we're looking at uh, possibly BBC Trust. We're already talking to uh, Japanese Education TV Netherlands to provide us with ideas and possibly with uh, financial resources as well. Now I'll leave ourselves with f five design considerations that I think has made a difference for us. So the strong political will has created an impetus, unprecedented. Uh, visioning exercise with the bureaucracy. So both uh, bureaucracy that make decisions about education without learning about education, without knowing about education, and also people who are involved in promoting education, the education bureaucracy, so to speak, the education officers in the districts and the, and the sub-district, the opposite level and also the teachers. So it's essentially, we are seeing, it's not the vision per se, but it's the visioning process, the involvement, the empowerment that they feel when they actually provide an input in a, in a, in a, in a, in a setting like this, physical setting or even a virtual setting. We've also undertaken uh, with Ministry of Education, Ministry of Primary and Mass Education, uh, many development partners, many nonprofit organizations, NGOs, and also for-profit organizations, massive capacity development that we're trying to coordinate, but it's, it's primarily being coordinated by the Ministry of Education and Primary and Mass Education. Uh, and we have seen huge programs, projects in, in these two ministries that can be much more effective if you can just put them in a single thread of education effectiveness. So if you can develop the vision and go through this visioning process. Uh, Co-creation, I already mentioned. So this teacher portal, we believe, uh, is, is a game changer in terms of how teachers motivate in classroom. And the sense of competition. Uh, we've also seen that the competition has created a very interesting sense of incentive for teachers. So being able to compete for that coveted award from the education minister or from the prime minister at the end, of the end of the year actually is very appealing to the teacher. So the combination of all these, I think, have created a very interesting uh, set of possibilities for us. Uh, when we look back of how we have done this, uh, I think we've taken an unreasonable approach in a, in a traditional sense. So a British playwright uh, talked about the unreasonable man creates progress. Uh, our approach has been to not aim too much, but shoot. In the case of the union councils in those two locations that has grown throughout the country in the multimedia classrooms that was set up in seven schools and then grow, grew to about 20,500. So we feel that we've taken an unreasonable approach, an untraditional approach. Thank you very much.